Good morning, Calvary. Thank you so much for being here today to join with us in worshiping our King, Jesus Christ. If you are fairly new to Calvary, or if even this is your first time and you'd like more information about who we are, we have a Connect desk out there that is staffed by a couple of people every Sunday. And uh, at that Connect desk is a little sign that has a QR code that you can scan with your QR scanner on your phone, and it'll bring up a registration form so that we can get your contact information, and then we can get you information about our church, and you can use that to communicate with us. We would encourage you to do that. Would you stand, please, for our call to worship this morning? From Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. Let's worship the king.
Amen. Give a praise offering to the King. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Well, a couple of uh, announcements that are important for you to know about. Uh, we have a, a, an Operation Christmas Child ministry going on right now. It's our privilege to partner with Samaritan's Purse and to send Christmas gifts with the gospel all over the world to children. The boxes for packing are available in the atrium in front of the church offices. When you get them filled, according to the, all the suggestions that they will give you, you can bring them back and return them to the same location. Coming up on November 13th, the youth group is going to be packing boxes and they need your help. So if you're not able to pack your own, but you would like to donate items to go into a box, you can bring all of those items to the youth room. There's a place for you to deposit them outside the youth room. And uh, that youth event will take place on November 13th. Kids Link volunteer training is coming up. If you are interested in serving or already are serving in children's ministry in our church, uh, we would love to have you be our guests for a soup luncheon on November 6th from 11.30 until 2 p.m. You can contact our children's ministry director, Amanda Koppel, for more information. We have a new baby in the church, Everett Martin Garbasiak. Congratulations to Brandon and Tiffany, and uh, the baby was born on October 17th, and so in the atrium in the Kids Link hallway, there's a treasure chest that we have out there, and that door will be open starting next week, and you have to make sure there's treasure in it. And so please bring your baby gifts for this family and fill that treasure chest up so we can present it to them as a gift of love from all of us. Giving is amazing. Giving is the way that we get to experience more depth of the heart of God than any other way because he so loved that he gave his only son to us. Let's pray together. Father, uh, there's multiple options for people to give to your ministry here at Calvary and around the world. And whether it be by cash or check donations in the boxes at the back of the eight of the sanctuary, whether it be through online giving through the church center app, whatever it might be, we pray, Lord Jesus, that you will multiply these gifts and expand the kingdom work for the glory of Jesus because your people are generous. And we thank you in your precious name. Amen. Ben Bogle is coming right now, uh, representing our AIM team, which is our area and international missions team here at Calvary, and he has a couple of updates on things that will interest you. Ben? Thank you. Well, good morning. It's exciting to be here and to share. Uh, some of you may be aware, my wife and I and our four children, we served overseas for over seven years in a remote village, and uh, we were never fully supported and being in a remote village, it was always nice to get those cards for holidays, for birthdays. And then we'd have some supporters that would send us a Christmas love offering. And it helped us to be able to splurge for our kids during the holidays. Well, we have that privilege here. And so starting today, for the next two weeks, we are gathering special offerings above the offering for the church that is a missionary Christmas love offering or gift. And so you can... Submit that through the uh, church app, or there's also envelopes in the back next to the boxes there that you can give a love offering. Also, there are two tables out in the atrium, and there are cards out there. Go ahead and give a word of encouragement. Share with missionaries that you're praying for them as well. And that offering, after the two weeks, we're going to gather together, divide it up, and to be able to share it with the other missionaries. And then I'm really excited to be able to share with you today. Uh, in August, we had a family or a couple come and to share. I do know their name, but I cannot share that for security reasons. Also, Nick and Jenna Fast with uh, Athletes in Action, those two families, the elders have voted and we will start supporting them. They're in the budget for the missions budget 2022. And so we are so thankful and just wanna share that with you as well. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you 
provide us the opportunity to be able to share and to give. And we pray, Lord, that we may be able to give words of encouragement and offerings to uh, support our missionaries who are serving. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we can send and support two other families again to serve and to reach the lost. Thank you that we have this opportunity and we have been blessed with the ability to serve you and to glorify you. And Lord, we just lift this up to you in Christ Jesus' name, amen.
from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, to reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to Till that stone was room for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who come to the Father. Amen. You may be, uh, excuse me, you may be seated, and those that have kids that need to go to Discover Link, they may be dismissed at this time. Um, this week, I kind of had a pretty easy week in my life um, until this morning. Um, and I share the story with you because I don't want you to think that just because I'm the prayer guy that's standing up in front of you guys that I have my life together. Um, but I have this habit, and I don't know if it's a bad habit or a neutral habit, of using my Bible as a file cabinet. And so I have all these notes in here, and this morning as I grabbed my Bible to come to church, one of the notes from uh, the prayer study we conducted this spring fell out, and it kind of struck me after my week that the first thing I saw was, it says, if you aren't praying, you're quietly confident that all you need is time, money, and skills to get through this life. And as I reflected on this last week, I relied more on my time, 
money and skills than praying. And so I just come before you and I want to confess that even though I look like I have it all together, um, this is far from the truth and that I just need to be humbly more dependent upon the Lord and I encourage all of us to be more humbly dependent upon the Lord. So I want to just pray for us as a church body and also for the search team uh, and as our, our leaders too just to keep uh, walking in the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before you and that uh, we don't have to have our life together, um, but we can just come to you just as you found us, um, humbly dependent upon you. So Lord, we just pray that that will be more evident in my life this upcoming week and in the lives of all those that are here listening in person or online. Thank you for the search team as they're conducting the next associate pastor you have uh, to serve your body here. I just pray that they'll have a unity and humble dependence upon you. Uh, we just pray for our elders and Pastor John, Pastor Josh, and Pastor Evan um, as they continue to shepherd this flock well, that they may do so uh, on a dependence upon you, Lord. We just pray all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you, James. I want to clear up a couple things that he said. One, he said that he has skills. Yes, he does. But the other thing that he said is it looks like he has everything together. I don't know about that. Just kidding. James and I are friends. I can give him a hard time. I know I don't have everything together. Am I right? Are you, do you guys have it all together? No, don't nod so emphatically when I say that, Abby. Let's continue our study in Philippians, and uh, would you just pray with me? Father, we open your word, and we look for your guidance and your understanding, not our own. We look to have you apply it to our lives, not us to apply it to someone else's life. And we hold your word in high regard, the highest regard. We thank you for your holy word that you've given us to study and to understand through the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for what you're about to teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to read this morning uh, to start in Philippians chapter 2. We're going to finish chapter 2 today. We're going to start in verse 19 and go through verse 30. And if you're able to stand as we read, would you please do that? Uh, but may your hearts be reverent before the word of God as we read it. I want you to notice the difference on the screen. It's not to confuse you. For those of you who never learned cursive or how to read cursive, um, I'm sorry that this looks like a foreign language. But my intent in this is so many times when we stand and we read God's word, we read it in the same tone because it's God's word, right? We have a preachy tone when we read it. I don't want you to forget that this is actually a letter that was personally and intimately written from Paul to the Philippians. And this particular passage that we're going to read today may seem strange. It may seem like, how are we going to spend a half an hour studying this passage? But as we read it, would you remember, this is a personal letter, and I'll try to read it in such a tone, but don't critique my tone. Philippians 2, starting in verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. 
may be seated. If you remember back to the beginning of this Philippians series, I put up that kind of structure of how Philippians was written, the greater than sign, a a sideways V, if you will. And this particular passage was the tip of the V, the most important part of the letter to Philippians. You may go, I think you're wrong. We're going to figure out why today. It seems like a strange thing to have the focal point be travel plans, right? Paul telling them, I'm sending you some dudes, right? Here's kind of a story about them, but How is that the most important thing of this letter? You also might be wondering, is it just travel plans? And it's right in the middle of his letter. Why wouldn't he put that at the end like he did in Colossians 4? He wrote that Tychicus is going to come to you. He did that at the end of the letter where it would kind of make sense, right? So why in Philippians is it right smack dab in the middle and we're supposed to look at this as the most important thing? Well, what Paul is actually doing, he's giving, there's many reasons for this, or potential reasons, but one of the main, or two of the main reasons is it's an update on communication, okay? It's, a, it's communicating to the church that he loves. He couldn't call them, he couldn't FaceTime them, he didn't have a Zoom meeting with them, so he had to write to them. So he's updating them on events. He's also providing a solid proof, living examples of two men who are just like Christ in the way that they act, that the church can look towards. Because Paul isn't with them, right? He's awaiting his trial. He's on house arrest. So what he's doing is he's giving them a communication update, but he's also giving them an example of two solid guys that they can look to. So let's deal with the first one, the communication update. That's one purpose. What is the purpose of this update? Well, the Philippians, as I just said, and Paul are separated. Paul is always about encouraging them and showing his concern and his love for them. And so he wants to let them know that even though he's not with them, he's thinking about them. He's caring for them, and he wants them to feel communicated to. When you have that inside track of knowledge, you feel special, don't you? When someone goes out of their way to communicate with you, to update you, you kind of feel like, oh, I mean something to that person. That's what Paul is doing here. He's letting them see his heart for them, and he's getting them up to speed on what's important. It's almost like a missionary update. You all are familiar with when we get missionary newsletters or when someone stands up here and gives us an update. They say, here's my plan. Here's what's happening in my absence. Here are some people that you can trust that are part of my ministry, and you can learn from their example when I'm not around. That's what Paul is saying. So let's look at the two people. What is the purpose of sending Timothy? Right away in verse 19, he tells us that he's going to send Timothy to you soon. He doesn't say right now, he says soon. And if you remember, there's a couple parts that we can see that Paul is actually going to send Timothy later rather than sooner. He'd love to send him now, but he's going to send him in a little bit. So we know that he's sending him later rather than sooner. And what we see when Paul starts verse 19, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's telling the Philippians that no matter what the timing is, no matter what the plan is, I, Paul, trust in the Lord. I'm hoping in the Lord for when Timothy goes to you. It's not necessarily up to me. No matter when it happens, if it's later than what I expected, this is what Paul is saying. I trust that the Lord has got this, that it's his plan and it's his way. But the purpose of sending Timothy is threefold. One, to take information to the Philippians. Notice in verse 23, jump forward a little bit. He says, I hope to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. So again, Paul repeats himself. He says, I'm going to send Timothy to you soon, but he gives us more information. He says, Timothy is going to bring information to the Philippians of Paul's outcome whether he lives or he dies. Remember, that's what we're facing here. That's what Paul is looking at, life or death. And he says, as soon as I know that, or as soon as Timothy knows that, he's going back to you. He's going to bring the most recent information about Paul. Paul also reassures them. Remember, Paul is always encouraging, always loving them. Paul reassures them that he's not just sending Timothy because he doesn't want to be there. Notice what he says in verse 24. I also trust in the Lord 
that shortly I myself will come. If you were a church, let's say the church of Philippi, and you heard that Paul is sending you two people, there may be some of you that would say, he just doesn't want to be with us. He keeps sending all these representatives, but he never wants to come to us and love us in person. And Paul squashes that right away. Yes, I'm going to send you Timothy. Yes, I'm talking about this other guy, Epaphroditus, but I will come to you shortly. So he's reassuring them, I want to be with you. But until all the details are worked out, I can't be with you, and Timothy can't be with you yet, because he's going to bring you information. So that's one purpose of sending Timothy. Another is to get information So Paul wants to get information from Timothy when Timothy returns. Notice in verse 19, Paul says that I may be cheered by news of you. I'm going to send you Timothy so he can then report back to me. And Paul is saying, I'm going to be encouraged. What does that again tell you about Paul? What does it tell you about the church in Philippi? That they are strong believers who are standing firm in the truth, right? Paul doesn't say, I'm going to get information back from Timothy when he returns, and I'm going to be disappointed in you. No, it tells us, verse 19, I'm going to be cheered by the good news that he's going to bring back because you guys are living it. You guys are doing exactly what Scripture, what I, Paul, am writing to you. I'm going to be cheered by that news that Timothy brings back to me. I can't wait to hear about it. So we see that Timothy was going to take information to Philippi. He was going to give information back to Paul. But he also was a living example of Jesus Christ. We're not going to expand on that until later. But remember, that's a third reason of why Timothy is, is going. Because he's a living example of Jesus Christ. So let's look at Epaphroditus then. What is the purpose of sending him? We see that he's going to be sent sooner rather than later. So Timothy's waiting. Epaphroditus is going now. He's going very, very soon. Notice in verse 25 and 28, Paul says this, I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, and I am more eager to send him. Why was Paul more eager to send Epaphroditus? One of the reasons is because it was for his mental and physical health. Epaphroditus' mental and physical health. You recognize in verses 26 and 27, Paul says these things. He's been longing for you all. Mental health, he wants to be with them. He's desiring to be with them. And he also is distressed because they heard that he was ill. So here's Epaphroditus, he's saying mentally, I just, I'm longing to be with them. They're worried about me and I want to go to them. And so that's one reason he's going. But you notice 27, it says Epaphroditus was ill. He was near death. I have to send him. He can't be out here any longer before something else happens. So I'm going to send him home. So it was for his own health. But Paul is sending him for the ministry's health. Verse 27, God had mercy on him and me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. And Paul even says, I need to send him to you so that I'm less anxious Anxious means less sorrowful or free from grief or trouble in thought. So Paul would have grieved the death of Epaphroditus when we're talking about sorrow upon sorrow. Imagine what would have happened if Epaphroditus would have died. Paul would have grieved that death. But then Paul would have further grieved because Epaphroditus would have died in service to Paul. So there's a part of us that would go, that's kind of my fault, isn't it? Paul would have been grieving over that. Paul would have been grieving about the feelings of the, of the Philippians when Epaphroditus would have died, if he would have died. And so it's sorrow upon sorrow upon sorrow. And Paul is saying, I need to send him to you to have a reunion so that I don't have to worry about his health. I don't have to worry about you guys. I can continue the work of Jesus Christ without the worry and the trouble. So I'm sending Epaphroditus to you. So it was not only for Epaphroditus' health, for Paul's health and the ministry health, but it was also for the Philippians, as you kind of can see. Verse 28, it says that you may rejoice at seeing him again. As a church, if we were to send someone out with a goal, as a messenger, to go do a task, and we heard back, now, we hear back pretty immediate. We could get on the phone and get updates right away. But imagine you're in this weird state of limbo and you know that he's sick. You know that maybe he almost died, but you can't get any other information except by a letter that takes a long time. 
your heart would be troubled, right? Someone that you care about and love for the sake of the gospel. You'd be going, I wonder if they're okay. Your heart would ache for them. And Paul is saying, I'm going to send him back to you because you're going to be eager to see him. You're going to rejoice at seeing him. And it's going to be an amazing reunion. All the troubles in that category will be gone because he's reunited with you. He knew that they were concerned for Epaphroditus. Paul was concerned for them being concerned about Epaphroditus. So the best thing to do, send him home. For the Philippians' sake, for Paul's ministry, for Epaphroditus' health. But fourthly, Epaphroditus was going to be sent because he was a living example of Jesus Christ. Remember, this is the culmination This is what we're seeing. It's not just practical communication. The reason that this is the central passage, the main focus of Philippians, is because these two guys prove to the Philippians that living the life that Paul described in Philippians chapter 1 and 2 that we've studied is possible. You can do it. It's not just Jesus alone that did it, but through the power of Jesus Christ, Timothy and Epaphroditus are living examples of everything that Paul has written to the church. And I have to send them to you because now you can see it. You can see their example. We need examples. We rely on examples. Some examples bring us down. We quickly learn from a bad example, don't we? But we need living examples of Jesus Christ. D.A. Carson says much Christian character is as much caught as it is taught. What he means is it's picked up by constant association with mature Christians. There's a quote that says this about the Christian life. Many think that our Christian life is like slamming a thousand dollar bill down on the table and saying, here it is, Lord, here's my life. But in reality, Christian living is like having $1,000 in quarters. And on the little, everyday, mundane things, you're spending 25 cents of Christ-like love constantly. That's a living example. A life that is consistent for who Jesus Christ is. Mark Twain says this about good examples. Few things are harder to put up with than the annoyance of a good example. You know what he's talking about. That guy, right? Oh, you're sending us Timothy. You mean that guy that I'm annoyed with because he always acts like Jesus, right? Don't pretend like you're more spiritual because you don't feel that way. We've all felt that way, right? That guy always does the right thing or that lady is so up here on a pedestal. But we need living examples, don't we? We need those people to annoy us because in their annoyance we go, How do they do that? Deep down, somewhere in your soul, in your heart, you go, I know I'm supposed to react that way. How does does he do it? You might even have a person in your mind right now who annoys you, but they do it because they're a living example of Jesus Christ. The truth is we need those living examples, so let's look at that. Let's look at the second reason, one one of the many reasons why this is the central point. But this is a big one. Because Timothy and Epaphroditus have character. They're demonstrating the character of Jesus Christ. They are the living examples of Philippians chapters 1 and 2. So let's look at Timothy. What about Timothy? Well, we see that in verse 20, he cared for others. I have no one like him, writes Paul, who's going to be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Of all the people that Paul knows, he says, I have nobody like you. I have no one like Timothy who's genuinely going to care for the needs of others, so I have to send him to you. He loves you. He wants to minister to you. So what I'm going to do here in this next section is I'm going to remind you of things that Paul wrote in Philippians 1 and 2 for how Timothy and Epaphroditus model that. And what Paul is saying in verse 20 about how he has no one like Timothy, Timothy models what Paul wrote in verse 5, verses 3 through 5 of Philippians 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. 
Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Timothy's heart was to have more concern for the flock of people that he was ministering to than he had for himself. So when the Philippians read that letter, and they go, oh, how in the world am I supposed to live up to that? Oh, wait, here's Timothy. Timothy cares like no one else that Paul knows. So he's a living example. We also see that Timothy was a companion. Verse 22, Paul says, How as a son with a father, he served with me in the gospel. Timothy illustrates What Paul wrote in chapter 1 of Philippians when Paul writes, well, I need someone who is standing firm in one spirit with one mind side by side with me for the faith of the gospel. And Paul even starts the book of Philippians, the letter that he wrote, in verse 1 by saying, Paul and Timothy. They're united. They're side by side like a son with a father. There's this companionship that Paul is saying, I'm sending to the Philippians because you need to see this in action. And this is the guy to show you. Paul loves Timothy. More than just a volunteer who fills a role or does a job. He's part of the family of God. They were together for the gospel no matter what. But we also know from verse 22 that he was a proven follower and leader. You know Timothy's proven worth, Paul writes. Timothy doesn't just say the right things. He does what the Lord says in a consistent, tangible way. He is a living example of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, you need him. You need to see what he does. Because you're going to catch what he does. I can't just teach it to you in a letter. You need that living example. That's Timothy. What about the character of Epaphroditus? You're going to notice that they're very different descriptions. Both valid, living examples of Jesus Christ, but they're uniquely gifted. So Epaphroditus, we see in verse 25, an entire list, five things that Paul uses to describe Epaphroditus. He says, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my needs. Five things. As a brother, Paul describes him. Paul is saying to the Philippians, he is an adopted part of God's family. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a very quick way to remember whose we are and what we are working towards. So by this simple description, Paul says, Epaphroditus is my brother. We're united in one truth. We are part of the same family, not because of what we did, but because of what Jesus did. He's a brother. He's also a fellow worker. So although Epaphroditus came to help Paul, putting him in a position of like servanthood, where Paul could have said, my servant Epaphroditus. No, Paul quickly levels the playing field and he says, my fellow worker, we're equals in this thing. We're working together for the same goal. We're co-workers for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the cause of Christ It's not a hierarchy. He's not telling them that Epaphroditus is lower because they sent him on a servant mission. He's saying he is a fellow worker. We're together. We're brothers. We're fellow workers. But more than that, we're fellow soldiers. Paul loved the illustration of a soldier. And he describes Epaphroditus as a fellow soldier. He became ill while on the battlefield for the Lord. He didn't deserve a shameful return to Philippi. Look at verse 29. Paul says that he deserves honor and to be received with joy. It would be very easy for the Philippians to look at Epaphroditus and go, we gave him a mission. He didn't get to complete it. He's getting sent home early. What are we going to do now? Paul recognizes this and he says, guys, this guy's my brother my fellow worker. He's a fellow soldier. He fought for exactly what he was supposed to do. Don't receive him with shame. Welcome him with joy. Welcome him with open arms. Give him the honor that is due a soldier who fought for the Lord. In verse 28 of chapter 1, Paul describes exactly what Epaphroditus would show. 
He was not frightened in anything by his opponents. You remember when we talked about that, standing firm for what you believe in? Don't be scared off by anything because you have the power of Christ. This is exactly what Paul recognized the attitude of a soldier looked like. Don't be frightened by anything. Epaphroditus did that. He wasn't scared off by anything. He fell ill and he almost died. Remember in chapter 1, verse 20, when Paul says, Christ is going to be honored in my body. Whether life or death, he's going to be honored in my body. Epaphroditus illustrates that. He almost died. He fell ill and Christ is honored in his body. He's going to accomplish the task that was put before him. The fourth thing that Epaphroditus illustrates is that he was a messenger sent by the Philippians to show love and care and give a gift to Paul. He was there to serve as a messenger. He had a task. He was going to accomplish that no matter what. He looked forward on what was ahead, the goal that he had to achieve, to accomplish for the cause of Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying he was a messenger. He did what he was supposed to do. And then finally he says he was a minister. Not by, not by job title or position, but by, by his practice. Epaphroditus ministered to the needs of Paul. He had a minister's heart. I can't wait to serve. Whatever you need, I'm going to do. Paul is reminding the Philippians that this guy, Epaphroditus, has character. He is a living example of Jesus Christ. Epaphroditus pointed to Jesus. In verse 26, it says, He's been longing for you all, and he has been distressed because he heard, you heard that he was ill. Do you realize what's happening here? Epaphroditus is the one who was sick and near death. And do you know what was on his mind? The Philippians' concern for him. I don't want them to be concerned with me. I just, I can't get over it. They're probably so worried. And here he is, almost dead. And all he can think about is how worried they must be. Does this happen? Has this happened to any of you? I know in, in marriage, if... If I get sick, I know my wife's concern is for me. But my concern is for the rest of our whole huge household that's chaotic, and here I am laid up on the couch. My concern is for her, and vice versa. If she gets sick, her concern is for me, because I'm hopeless. Can he even make a sandwich? No, I'm kidding. I'm not hopeless. But you have this give and take of intense love for each other that even though you're miserable, the thing on, the, on your mind is not your misery. The thing on your mind is, are they doing okay? Are they cared for? And Epaphroditus feels this. He cares for them. First Peter 5 tells us that, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, here it is, because he cares for you. Epaphroditus was a living example of Jesus Christ because he cared for the Philippians. In his time of need, he wasn't thinking about his need, he was thinking about them because he cared for them. So Epaphroditus points us to Jesus. It points the Philippians by his own example to who Jesus Christ was. Epaphroditus was committed to the future glory that he knew he was going to be exalted one day. And that focus allowed him to get through the troubled times that he was in. He fell ill and almost died. But he didn't care. His concern was for the Philippians. He pointed to Christ. He was also near death for the cause of Christ. We saw in chapter 2, verse 8, Paul wrote that Jesus became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The greatest example possible. And in no way is Epaphroditus taking glory, but Epaphroditus saw the example of Jesus Christ, and he said, I'm going to live that example. And I became ill. I almost died He was willing to die for the cause of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, go. Epaphroditus, go back to Philippi. Be reunited with them and live the life that you know how to live through Jesus Christ. Point to him. Help them by the way that you live. 
Each one of these two are different, Timothy and Epaphroditus. They're very different in how they are skilled, but both of them model Jesus Christ. So for you, what does that even mean? You're uniquely gifted. You are uniquely created, and your gifts are needed. Timothy and Epaphroditus were individuals with specific gifts and talents, but each of them modeled humility. They glorified God, not self, in how they lived. Paul knew that Philippi needed both men, but for you, each of you, being uniquely gifted by God, you get to accomplish his glory. You get to do his will. A lot of times we think just because someone else is in a ministry or in a relationship with someone, I'm not needed. But in fact, this shows us that Philippi needed both men, both of their unique giftings for you. Don't get turned off just because someone is already there. I don't need to step in. You don't need to take over, but you have a way of living an example of Jesus Christ that other people don't. It takes the body of Christ. Get involved in people's lives. Get involved in ministry because you are needed. You are uniquely gifted. And Paul shows us that by sending two men whose descriptions are different whose character expressions are different, but they all express Jesus Christ. They all are focused on Jesus. As I was reading through this, I couldn't help but think of that personal letter that Paul is writing. And remember at the beginning, we, we reminded you that Paul is on house arrest for this. He's writing this letter while physically chained to another guard. I don't know how long that chain was. It doesn't matter, does it? He obviously had to navigate around the house and do different things, but he was physically chained to a guard. I couldn't help but wonder what that guard was thinking, what that soldier was thinking. Here's Paul using the soldier example, and here's a soldier chained to him. Remember, these soldiers were part of an elite group. They were the best of the best. They served Caesar, a man who demanded respect, not earned it. A man who desired to have knees bowed and tongues confessing that he is Lord for his own glory, a man who had servants to carry out all of his bidding, but he was never a servant himself. A man who had soldiers to kill for him and ensure that he was never in danger. Caesar wasn't a man willing to die for others. And that king, Caesar, produced followers that had the same mindset. These soldiers were well trained in the way of Caesar. They were an elite group, and they were always for looking for how to advance up the ladder, not humbly step down the ladder like Jesus did. They were seeking glory, not giving glory. They were serving Caesar, but not from the heart, only from the obligation and self-protection. And they were always looking for advancement. How do I go from this elite group to this elite group? Where am I going to retire someday? How can I acquire more glory, more fame, more power? That's what these individuals became. Because they were serving a king who did the same thing. Caesar was all about him. Call me Lord. But as I think about this soldier chained to Paul, listening to him write letters, watching him talk about other men who didn't look like any other men that this soldier had ever heard of. Paul didn't look like any other person that, that this soldier had ever seen before. And so if you saw the title of today's sermon, it was that a king like no other produces soldiers like none other. Produces followers like none other. So would you bear with me a minute? Because I imagine that a soldier chained to Paul would have asked himself, what kind of king must this person serve? Because it was in opposition to the king that he served. This soldier knew that he was selfish and all about power and advancement, and he looks at Paul, who's humble, and he's describing two other people who are humble and willing to die 
And so join me in the thought process of this soldier. This guy, Timothy, has no ambition except to serve his king. Epaphroditus was ready to and almost did die for the king that he served. And Paul actually wants nothing more than to be with his king. I don't want to spend the rest of my life with Caesar. I don't even think it's right to love Caesar in the way that I think these men love their king. I think there's something wrong with these guys. But being chained to this guy every hour, every day, I've had a chance to see what he's all about. And it actually seems genuine. It transformed even. I've never seen anything like it. So it must not be that these men are strange or weird. It must be that there's something amazing about the king that they serve. And there is something amazing. Our king. Our king came to die for us. He came to serve, not be served. He came to transform lives, not demand conformed lives. He isn't just an impressive man. He is God in fullness of glory, but in the humblest of lives. He was pierced for our transgressions. He rose again to conquer death, and he did it for you and for me, King Jesus himself. You see, a king like none other, Jesus, there is no one that compares. A king like none other produces followers like none other. That's what Paul was telling the Philippians. Timothy and Epaphroditus, I don't have anyone like them. They serve Almighty God. King Jesus is their main focus, the one they serve with their whole hearts. And so these men aren't going to look like anything else in the world. They're going to shine as lights in a dark world. And for us, that's the type of follower we get to be because we serve that same king, a king like none other. You can't buy anything in this life. You can't find anything in this life. You can't compile everything in this life to even stack up next to or compare to a king like Jesus. And he is the one we get to serve. And so what's produced from you is the life of Christ, to be in a living example of those around you and to be a light that's shining in a dark world. Let's pray. Father, in all of your power and might and glory, there is no one or no thing that compares to you. And in all of that power, in all of that majesty, the one who receives and is due all of the glory, you humbled yourself and you came down for me. A king that isn't grabbing hold of the power right in front of him. A king who went to death, death on a cross for me. A king who isn't looking to have all of the servants do his bidding. It's a king who says, I'm going to serve because I love. Lord, may we, as the body of Christ, be overwhelmed right now with who you are. So that it's not about us trying to achieve that status of being a living example. It's about us allowing you to work out your salvation, our salvation through your power. Let it work out in our lives so that others see it. Others know it. And it doesn't point to us, it points to you. Because it isn't about us becoming a follower like none other. It's about serving a king who's like none other and allowing you to work in our lives and be the expression so that when we're bumped, Jesus comes out. So that when our days are tough, our minds are on the eternal glory that we have, and all we want to do is proclaim Christ, and that's where our joy comes from. Lord, thank you for being a king like none other. 
And thank you that in all of your power and in all of your glory, you are good and you are a good, good father. Amen. Thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers. the ability through the power of Jesus Christ to live as followers like none other because we serve a king like none other. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you 
for the glory of God. May your life be a living example of Jesus Christ to those around you. Amen.